Good evening. Welcome back to worship. Let's stand as we sing. We have come into his house. Heavenly Father, Lord, we have gathered and come to worship you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're thankful for the day. We're thankful for opportunities we've had today to share your love. We're thankful for the opportunities to be here tonight. We pray, Heavenly Father, that um, you use Brother Randy, that you speak through him the words that you would have us to hear tonight. Be with us tonight as we sing your praises. Pray for those that couldn't be with us tonight. Pray, Lord, that you be with them. In Jesus' name, amen. Onward, Christian soldiers. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with a of Jesus going on before Christ the royal master leads against the foe forward into battle see his banner go onward Christian soldiers Marching as to war With the cross of Jesus Going on before Like a mighty army Moves the church of God Brothers, we are treading Where the saints have trod We are not divided All one body we One in hope and doctrine One in charity Onward Christian soldiers Marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Onward, then, ye people, join our happy throng, blend with our good voices. In the triumph song, glory, Lord, and honor unto Christ the King. Through, through countless ages, men and angels sing. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war.
Amen, and all of God's people said, amen. Good to see you at the Lord's house tonight. Good-looking bunch here tonight. And I'm trying to look everywhere when I say that, but it's good to see you. We have some folks that were sick over the weekend that are able to be back here this evening, and we're glad that you are better, and we want to pray for those who are still uh, not feeling well and not able to be here and and uh, I suspect that we could have some watching a ball game or two. Uh, maybe that they'll feel guilty if they hear me say this. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm going to preach tonight about the life we ought to live. The life we ought to live. Uh, I don't know if all of you know where Spruce Pine, North Carolina is. Spruce Pine, North Carolina is a beautiful part of the world we've we've ridden harleys through there a lot of different times but this remote area of north carolina is tremendously important to the rest of the world it really is and it's a mineral that's found there snowy white grains of sand just as soft as powdered sugar 
It's quartz is what it is, but not just any quartz because spruce pine, you're never going to believe this, but it's the source of the purest natural quartz, a species of pristine sand that's ever been found on earth. And this ultra pure material plays a key role in producing the silicon that is used to make computer chips. And so that smartphone that's in your purse or your back pocket, uh, there's a good chance that the chip in your cell phone or your laptop or your, your pad, uh, was, your tablet was made using sand from this obscure Appalachian backwater town. So making today's computer chips is this fiendishly complicated process and it requires essentially pure silicon. The slightest impurity can throw their tiny little systems out of whack. Now, finding the silicon is easy. It's one of the most abundant elements on earth. The problem is that it never comes naturally in pure form. Separating out the silicon takes considerable doing. The sand is blasted in a powerful electric furnace resulting in 99% pure silicon. You'd think that'd be good enough. 99% pure silicon, but that's not good enough for high tech for the chips. And so additional extreme processing is required because computer chips, here's what they need. 99 point and then 11 nines after the decimal point. 99 point nine 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 nine. That's pretty pure, isn't it? That's what they require. And we're talking about one little lonely atom, probably, that's not silicon among billions of silicon companions, says geologist Michael Wellen. And modern tech devices require material that's of the greatest purity possible, and producing it requires intense refining efforts. And God requires unique people to be of the highest purity, to be uncontaminated by the world. And you know what? God spares no effort in our refining process. So tonight I want to preach on the life we ought to live from 1 Peter chapter 1. I want us to spend a few Wednesday nights in 1 Peter. The life we ought to live, 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to invite you uh, when you have found that or when you're ready to stand, if you're able to stand, uh, physically able to stand, stand, join me in standing for us to look at verses 1 and 2. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you tonight, and we uh, just praise you for who you are. We worship you because you are the one and only God. You are the God of the cosmos that created everything that is, that spoke the entire universe into existence. And Lord, you created man and woman, and you breathed into man the breath of life, and we became a living soul. And Lord, you created us unto good works. You created us for fellowship with you, and you created us for your purpose. And now, Lord, you require of us uh, purity, set-apartness. And, Lord, we know this in our head, but we're asking that tonight you speak to our hearts and that you would change our hearts and that you would help us allow the Holy Spirit who indwells us to guide us into all truth, to keep us pure, and, Lord, to serve you even more purely than 
na 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 and Lord, that we can be pure because of you that lives within us. Now, Heavenly Father, speak to people tonight. Meet our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Lord, if there's anybody that needs to be saved, bring salvation to their heart. If there's anybody here tonight that needs comfort, bring comfort to their heart. If there's somebody here that needs hope, Bring hope to their heart. And Heavenly Father, I just pray that all of our heartaches and heartbreaks could be healed by the powerful good news of Jesus Christ. Bless our nation, our president, our leaders. Bless our churches, our sister churches. And God, may we be one in Christ. And may we take the gospel to our community and to the cosmos. And we'll give you the praise, honor, and glory, thanking you for each person that's here. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, this greeting, they call it, this is a letter. Your Bible probably says the epistle uh, of Peter, the first epistle of Peter. And uh, the greeting to the letter, we would say, dear Kathy or dear Wendell and we would we would have that kind of greeting but the first two verses here uh, Peter identifies himself as writing to whom and and so it identifies the writer as Peter an apostle that an apostle is one who sent with a commission uh, an eyewitness of Jesus and his readers are strangers and that means resident aliens, that they, they are residents even though they're in this foreign land. And so they're strangers. They're not, they're not at home in the land where they're dwelling. And it was true politically, for they were Jews away from their homeland, but it was also true spiritually, for their citizenship was in heaven. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul wrote, But our citizenship is in heaven, and, I, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said to the stranger, scattered. Now, scattered means dispersed. If you've ever been a farmer or played farmer uh, or just had a yard and you... Uh, used either one of those seed sowers or like my grandfather was just so good at it, he could just take a bag of seed and just just sow the seed like that. I've, I've got one of those old-timey uh, seed sowers, and it I can set it, and it'll put a certain amount out and disperse the seed. But that's what that word scattered means, dispersed like a farmer scatters seed. Believers are God's seed, and he plants them, we might say us, where he wills. He places us where he needs us to grow. And I'm of the belief that God places people in the church, and that each local body, that he places people in the church according to their gifts and abilities. And so... He places his seed where he wills, and sometimes he uses persecution to scatter the seed. And that's what's going on here. Verse 2 outlines the plan of salvation. Think about it, what he's saying there when he says, uh, elect according to the foreknowledge of who? God the Father. Through what? Sanctification of the Spirit. Under what? Obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then he gives that famous part of that greeting grace unto you and peace be multiplied because grace always must come before peace amen you can't have peace without grace but as he outlines this plan of salvation we're chosen by the father we're set apart into faith by the spirit and we're cleansed by the blood of christ so the father chose you in christ before the foundation of the world according to paul's writing in ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight the son 
Jesus the Son saved you when he died for you if you accepted his work on the cross. But it took your surrendering to the Spirit to seal the transaction. So the Holy Spirit convicts us and draws us to him. But we must, he, he doesn't save us unless that we cooperate and that we respond in faith, in trusting belief. And then Paul talks about that our soul is sealed into the day of redemption. And so Peter now describes the lives that believers ought to live in this hostile world. Gets through the greeting, and we, we see the unique parts of that greeting to that first epistle of Peter. And the first th way he says we ought to live in this world we live in, this world of persecution, that we ought to live in hope in verses 3 through 12. And we're just going to hit the high spots here, but he says that an unsaved person is a person without hope. An unsaved person is a person without hope. Again, we turn to Paul's writing. The Ephesian letter, chapter 2, verse 12 says, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. You were apart from Christ. Excluded from citizenship in Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. And foreigners to the covenants of the promise. And then he says, without hope and without God in the world. Yet, the believer has a living hope because he has a living Savior. Turn back to 1 Peter again, chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in his great mercy, he has given us, look at this line here, new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, Christ is our hope, and we look for his soon expected return. <coughs> the Christian doesn't work for your hope. There's no way you can get hope through works. It's a part of our spiritual birthright. We're born again into this living hope. Now, this hope is not only a living hope, but it's a lasting hope. Look at verse 4 and 5. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. So it's a lasting hope. Who through faith are shielded by God's power unto the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed. So our hope is reserved in heaven where it cannot decay. Thieves can't break in and steal it. Moths cannot corrupt it. Uh, it's incorruptible. It can't be defiled. It can't lose its beauty. It can't lose its delight. But not only is the hope reserved, the believer, too, is kept. And that word kept is a military term. It means like a sentry guarded as a soldier. So it is kept in heaven for you. It's it's an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It's kept. It's guarded. There's a sentry guarding that hope in heaven for you. And it's kept by the Lord. We're kept by God's power. And it's because of the faith we have placed in Him. Nothing that we have done except in trusting belief. We have accepted what He completed for us on the cross of Calvary. And as he completed that work and we trusted what he did there, there's nothing we can do except in trusting belief embrace what he did for us there. Eternal security is not based on the faith of men, but on the faithfulness of God. And the believer is saved. And he is being saved daily. And the Bible says, Charles, that one day... When Christ returns, we will be saved completely, even from the very appearance of sin. And that's what we're looking for. First Peter 9, 1, 9, drop down under the ninth verse. We'll come back and get 6, 7, and 8. But look at verse 9. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. So the culmination of our faith, the end of our faith, is our salvation. The salvation of our souls, that complete uh, 
salvation when the Lord comes again. But until Christ returns, the believer is going to go through some testing. A faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. And our suffering is but for a little while. Look at verses 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice. Well, you probably need to back up to number 5 and say, what are we, what are we, what's in this? Verse 5 says, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And then he says, in this, this eternal salvation reserved in heaven for you, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. So he's saying you're going to suffer for a while here on this earth. And there's going to be suffering. And so uh, it's not going to be forever. It's going to be for a little while. The glory, though, will be forever. Look at verse 7. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The word trial means approval. When you put something to the test, you're proving it. Okay? And so it, that word in verse 6, the verse end of verse 6, had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. That was the proving ground of your faith. It, was it genuine or not? Is it real or not? So, so it's a proving ground, a proof, a trial that everything is real. It's approval. And the suffering that we endure here will result in more glory when Christ comes. So knowing this, look at verse 8. If we know this, we love him even more. Though you've not seen him, verse 8 says, we love him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Peter reminds us that the Old Testament prophets, Brother John, spoke of this salvation that we enjoy. In verses 10, 11, and 12, uh, he says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted and sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them, though, that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So even angels long to look into these things. And they did, didn't, did however, fully, these Old Testament prophets, they didn't fully understand the time. They didn't fully understand the circumstances in which it would appear. They saw the cross, and they saw the kingdom, and they fully believed that, and they prophesied that as the Holy Spirit led them, but they did not anticipate this church age probably, this present age of the church. So we ought to live in hope. So he says, how, how should we live? How, how ought we to live? Well, we ought to live in hope. And then verses 13 through 21, he says, you ought to live in holiness. You ought to live in that purity, that being set apart for holy living. He says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. So the mind is part of it. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. We ought to be thinking about it, that the Lord's a coming. And we're preparing ourselves for that. And those obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. When you were without Christ, is what he's saying. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I'm holy. So the blessed hope, who's the blessed hope? Jesus is the blessed hope, isn't he? His return, that's our blessed hope. And the blessed hope ought to make us live holy lives, according to verse 15. But just as he who called you is holy, well then so be holy in all you do. And then we must prepare our minds. Don't let your minds just fly loose on everything that this world 
has got going on. I mean, you, you drive yourself crazy and you'll lose sight of Jesus and lose sight of faith. Uh, prepare our minds. And another motive for separated living is the commandment of the Word of God. The prophet said this. Look, look there with me again at verse 16. For it is written, written those Old Testament prophets, be holy because I am holy. And so the written word express that and holy doesn't mean sinless perfection like a lot of people try to say uh, a com you know what it's a condition that's impossible in this life sinless perfection is uh, if somebody tells you they are in sinless perfection i would put my hand on my billfold and if you value anything else put your hand on that nobody's perfect what does the bible say about it there is none perfect except one. That's Jesus Christ. And we're all sinners. None of us are without sin. No, not one. We're all sinners. And so we ought to be set apart. We need to be separated unto God. And if we're God's children, then we ought to live and want to be like our Father. Now, there's a third motive for holy living and that's the judgment of God. Look at verse 17. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers, resident aliens, here in reverent fear. Because God is the one who judges. I, I think sometimes we have become the judge, don't you? We try to judge others without even trying to judge ourselves sometimes. If you want to destroy unity, you judge others. Take God's place there, and you'll destroy unity in the church. So holy living, a uh, motive for that is the judgment of God because each man's work he judges impartially. What does the Corinthian letter say that every believer will do? Every believer will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And everything that we do in this world, I don't have time to worry about Kathy Hall, what's gonna, what she's doing good and bad, because I'm going to give an answer to God for everything I do in this flesh. And I do enough bad that I'm going to have to give an answer for all that. And so I don't have time to judge anybody else. I hope that you don't have time to judge anybody else, that you know that... As a believer, if you're a believer, you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ since you call on the Father who judges each man's work impartially. It don't matter what your last name is. It doesn't matter how long you've been in this church or another church. It doesn't matter if your skin is white or black or brown or what. He will judge each man's work impartially. And because of that, Peter wrote, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear, this reverential awe because of who he is. God chastens his children today. He tests their works at the judgment seat of Christ, and he has no favorites, but he treats all of his children alike. Aren't you glad of that? I'm glad that that God doesn't play favorites. Verses 18 through 21 give a fourth motive for holy living, and that is the price that Christ paid for our salvation. In verse 18 and 19, about the fifth word out, I want to start, it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold, and then drop down to verse 19 but with the precious blood of Christ. It was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from this empty life that had been handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the foundation of the world. Wasn't a second plan, wasn't plan B. But he was just revealed in these last times, Peter wrote, for your sake and through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him and so your faith and hope are in God. 
You know what? Before we were saved, I don't care if you were 9 or 90, before we were saved, our lives were empty and our lives were meaningless. But now, he's saying they're full and they're happy through Jesus. Our salvation wasn't purchased with money. It took the blood of Jesus. And his death was planned by God before we were ever born. And God in his grace included us in that plan. Somebody said, who would have ever thunk it? I mean, how can you wrap your head around that? That in 2019, if there's a sinner boy or girl out here on these streets or in the houses that make up the, the town of Oneida, that Jesus included them when he died on the cross without regard to if they got a penny in their jeans or not, without regard to if their tennis shoes are $500 tennis shoes or 50 cent shoes that they picked up at Goodwill. It doesn't matter. Can you wrap your head around that, that the king of glory died on a cross and that God raised him from the dead so that that little boy or girl could be saved in Oneida, Tennessee 2,000 years later. Boy, I tell you what, we serve an awesome God. And I, this fourth motive for holy living is because of the price that God paid, Christ paid, so we ought to live in holiness. So we've learned tonight two things that we ought to live in hope, and we've learned that we ought to live in holiness, and finally, tonight, we ought to live in harmony. Verses 22, 23, 24, 25. We ought to live in harmony. Look at verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. Salvation gives us this living hope, a desire for a holy life and a wonderful fellowship with the people of God. The Spirit of God loved us and brought us to Christ. And this same Spirit has planted within us a love for the people of God. And if we don't have a love for the people of God, the Bible is very clear that how can we love God whom we have not seen if we can't love our brothers who we have seen? John made it clear that if we don't love our brother, then we don't love God. And look at this verse 22. Peter used two different words for love. Now in our English Bibles, regardless of your translation, it comes across love. But look here in this 22nd verse. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers. Philadelphos, brotherly love. Philadelphia, that's where they got that name. The city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. And so that word in the first use of love in verse 22, he said, you have sincere love for your brothers. But then he used that word we've talked about a lot, agapeo. He said, love one another deeply from the heart. He's talking about a selfless love, a putting somebody else first kind of love. The first one is love them because they love you back. And it's a mutual thing. But the second part Love one another deeply from the heart because of what Christ has done in you. He loved you so much that he died for you. And he's saying, love one another, agapeo one another deeply from the heart. And so the Christian possesses brotherly love, and that's, that's part of our human experience. 
but he also needs to exert some spiritual energy and love others the way God loves us. I need to be able to love Amon the same way that God loves me in this selfless love, this love that's willing to sacrifice my happiness and my well-being for somebody else's. Even unsaved people can show brotherly love. But it takes a Christian controlled by the Spirit to show agape love because the Holy Spirit that cleansed us and saved us and made us whole, reserved in the heaven for us, that salvation that is to come fully when Christ returns, it, that Holy Spirit can cause us to love somebody even that's unlovable. Peter really likes this phrase, born again. He says, we're born again through God's mercy into a living hope. And we're born again by the word of God and the love for the people of God. And he compares the word of God to seed as Jesus does in the parable of the sower in the Gospels. And like a seed, the word is small and the word is seemingly insignificant. But it has life, a seed does, and it has power within just like the word. And the word must be planted to do any good. And when it is planted in the heart, guess what? It produces fruit. When we plant the word of God in the heart, it produces fruit. God's word is eternal, and the fruit it produces is eternal, but the things of the flesh do not last. So, whatever we do in obedience to the word of God will last forever, because it's not our works. It's the power of God's love. It's the word of God that is eternal. But whatever we do in the energy of the flesh will look beautiful for a time, but will then die. We can build fellowship on works of the flesh and things that people uh, enjoy doing. Some church growth gurus call it affinity groups, things that people are interested in together. And it'll work for a while. But I'll tell you, true fellowship, biblical fellowship, only comes through the Word of God and the work of the Word of God in our hearts and lives. It'll bring lasting fellowship. So whatever we do in the flesh will look good but then die, but Christian harmony and unity is a blessing to the Lord, it's a blessing to the church, and it's a blessing to believers themselves. And if every believer, if you don't take nothing else home, get this. If every believer is obeying the word and practicing love, there will be harmony. There will be harmony. And my brothers and sisters, I love you. And according to Peter, this is the life that as believers we ought to live. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening thanking you that, Lord, the Word is eternal. And, Lord, we sometimes work in the flesh we're anxious in the flesh. We worry in the flesh. We try to rebuild harmony and unity in the flesh when really all we need to do is just read the Word, plant the Word in our hearts, let it germinate as the Holy Spirit 
attends to that implanted word. And then as we're obedient to that implanted word in our hearts, you will give unity and you will give harmony among your people. We'll have a common purpose because it will be your purpose. And it won't be my way, it'll be your way. So, Heavenly Father, thank you for this first chapter of Peter's first epistle. And thank you that it has taught me afresh and anew and hopefully others how we ought to live as believers. Lord, we pray, plant your word in our hearts and let us be obedient to it. Holy Spirit, bring us together to a work that you've called us to do and let us see souls saved, lives changed, relationships mended, and the harvest fields that are wide and ready for harvest brought in before they spoil. Dismiss us in thy love, thy fear, and thy favor. Bless our hurting and sick people, our broken people. Help us to yield not to temptation, but to be obedient to what thus says the word of God. Bless everyone here and the families of everyone here. Bless our brothers and sisters who could not be here. Bless all the people with all of this flu and other illness. And God, bless our nation. Bless our denomination. Bless us with conviction of the Holy Spirit and repentance that comes from the heart and cleansing that only the Holy Spirit can cleanse. And we will give you the praise and you the glory and we will say hallelujah to the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for being here.